Welcome to the Hyde Lecture Series here in the College of Architecture. My name is Zach Porter. I'm an assistant professor here at UNL. And I have the pleasure of introducing not one, but two distinguished speakers this evening who will both present lectures. So the format is we'll have two roughly 30 minute lectures back to back and then some question, answer, and discussion. First, we will hear a presentation from Matthew Krylik of Snow Krylik Architects. And then we'll hear from Matt Wallace of Lake Flato Architects. This lecture is co-sponsored with AIA Nebraska. And so I want to thank Executive Director Sarah Kay and everyone at AIA Nebraska for their work in making this event happen. I'm going to keep the introduction short, though, because we do have two lecture presentations. And I want to leave as much time as possible for our speakers. So in that spirit, I'll go ahead and give both introductions here at the beginning, and then we'll roll right into our two lectures back to back. Our second speaker tonight will be Matt Wallace, who is the co-leader of the Lake Flato Eco Conservation Studio. Matt studied under Pritzker Prize laureate Glenn Murcutt, who taught him the importance of sustainable practice. Since acquiring this philosophy, Wallace has implemented it in a number of projects ranging in scale and locale, from the northern landscapes of Montana and Illinois to the arid deserts of Arizona and Texas all while respecting each, climate's, each region's climate and context. Wallace's recent notable projects include the Ryerson Woods Education Center in Riverwoods, Illinois, and the Ian Nicholson Audubon Center in Gibbon, Nebraska. So we'll look forward to hearing from Matt later on this evening. But first, we'll be hearing from Matthew Krylik, who works as a design principal at Snow Krylik Architects in Minneapolis. The studio received AIA's 2018 Architecture Firm Award an honor that recognizes a practice that has consistently produced distinguished architecture for at least 10 years. He is the heart of the firm's collaborative working model with an active participation in both strategic and detailed design resolution. Additionally, he has taught at the University of Minnesota College of Design and Syracuse University, as well as participated in visiting critics and critiques at GSD and Washington University. Krylik was recently a juror for the Progressive Architecture Award and continues to participate on AIA juries throughout the country, as well as lectures in both academic and professional settings. Please join me in welcoming Matthew Krylik. Thanks. Uh, let's see. All right. Can everybody hear me? Yeah, it's working. I'll try not to drop this as I did earlier. Also going to set a timer to see if I make sure I don't go over time here. Um, all right. Well, thank you, everybody. It's great to be here. Um, share a little bit about our studio, um, a little bit about the sort of cultural shift that's happened in our studio, I think, in a lot of studios over the last three years. Um, and then share just a little bit of our recent work with you today. Um, our studio is located in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, Julie, my business partner, Julie Snow, founded the practice. Um, really designing really pragmatic building types, uh, manufacturing facilities. That sort of DNA um, has been with us ever since. We work on really a lot of pragmatic everyday building types. Um, I like to say from bus stops to uh, ballparks and kind of everything in between. Um, today though, I wanna focus in kind of these four different areas. So refocus is really about kind of what we've been through as a studio. I just wanna sort of share maybe a little more insight into kind of um, you know, how COVID social justice has really sort of shifted a lot of conversation and dialogue within our studio. Um, and then um, share just a few projects um, under these three categories of reuse, restore, reconnect. And I don't know why they're, oh, the font's not coming through, that's why. I'm like, my font's gonna look super funky all day. <laughs> um, so uh, first, you know, I think we're all familiar, um, maybe too familiar with, this uh, you know, incredibly small virus that has impacted not only the world, but um, the way we practice. Um, I remember I was coming back from New York at the very beginning of this, feeling kind of sick, went into the office, which I shouldn't have, immediately left, and I mean, I was out for days, and then our office shut down, so we lived like this. Um, for a long time, I was just, telling Matt, we're actually not even fully back in the office. So, you know, we're still adjusting to kind of what this means. I think we realized there's a ton of efficiency with some of these new tools, um, but we're also 
missing out on a lot of other aspects. Um, we've tried a lot during the last three years to bring people together, um, mainly outside, um, enjoying the seasons, but we've also focused a lot in the studio around just overall wellness and health. Uh, we have a yogi instructor that teaches yoga classes once a week. We have meditation once a week, running club, a lot of other things. Um, but what I think we realized that we still were missing is this sort of cross-pollinization of projects, sharing. Um, Matt, you, you were talking about sort of trying to avoid getting siloed. I think we were sort of going through the same thing of like, how do we make sure that we can still communicate and um, have impromptu meetings? Um, and I think most importantly, transfer knowledge, right? Both from junior to senior and, and back and forth uh, was really important. Um, we obviously, you know, the, after the murder of George Floyd, this had a ripple effect across our nation. You know, this was our backyard. So literally we had employees that were, you know, blocks away from the rioting, from um, the fire station that burned down. This is not that one. This is actually a fire state, or I'm sorry, a fire station. We were just pursuing a fire station. Um, this is a police station we designed um, almost two decades ago, and it was around uh, community policing. There was actually community space in this. And, um, you know, I think the lesson for me is just architecture obviously can't solve all of our issues. Um, but that had a really big impact on our studio members. There was really just a sort of outpouring of support financially in terms of time. We were um, matching donations for studio members. Um, but I think, you know, it, we felt like we needed to do more. Um, we have initiated uh, equity training for all of our studio members. We came together and wrote this as a studio, um, really defining what those goals would be together. This was really important um, for us. But then also wanted to find a way to hold ourselves accountable. Um, for those of you that don't know what the just label is, I'll just read the mission, um, is a society that is socially just, culturally rich, and ecologically restorative. Um, it's really great because it's a way for us every year to check around diversity, inclusion, equity, employee health, benefits, et cetera. And I think, um, you know, for our employees, it's a really important um, as well. Um, just before COVID, uh, we had started a nonprofit arm of the studio. You can see sort of the cute rearranging of letters to become ASK. Um, this has been really great for us to be able to do projects that are sort of outside of the scope of a traditional architectural practice. Um, two projects that we're working on right now that we were able to get grant funding for is um, the Mississippi Watershed. And this is where we're working with, it's the Minnesota equivalent to LEED certification, it's called B3. And we're creating a visual tool to help designers, architects, engineers sort of understand and manage water issues on site um, from the beginning of the process. Uh, and then uh, just started working with the Phyllis Wheatley House. Um, this is a really interesting organization that started, uh, well, used to be essentially a safe haven for African Americans that were visiting Minneapolis, St. Paul, that weren't allowed to stay in hotels. Um, the organization has grown to support youth um, throughout North Minneapolis um, in particular, uh, really large African American population and a very underserved community. And, they had been given this camp, which has been shut down for years, which we're trying to reopen. Um, the idea behind this is to get these kids out of these neighborhoods where there's just a lot of violence. They never have the opportunity to, to get outdoors. And so um, it's been really interesting and fun working with that organization. Um, and then finally, just I think one of the things we missed most um, over the last several years was just having robust design conversations, right? And this, the importance of like how important design is, is is how often we discuss it together. And so we have been um, really focused around sharing ideas, writings of other architects, other architects' work. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to read all this, but this is something Julie passed around. It's, it's a manifesto by um, Yvonne Farrell and Shelley McNarma of Grafton Architects. It's several years old, so you, you may have seen this, but um, I just think this is like one of the most beautiful sort of descriptions of what 
architecture can do. I'll just read the first one. Uh, free space describes a generosity of spirit and a sense of humanity at the core of architecture's agenda, focusing on the quality of space itself. Um, I'll pull a few excerpts out as we go through these categories. Um, and now I just wanna sort of walk through uh, a few projects that uh, we've been working on recently. Uh, we have done and continue to do a lot of adaptive reuse. It's um, from modernizations to um, you know, infrastructure projects. And for me, they're really um, compelling uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, I think they're some of the most sustainable ways we can design. Um, this is another excerpt uh, that I think also talks to kind of the poetry of what these can be about. The free space of time and memory, binding past, present, future together building inherent cultural layers, weaving the archaic and the contemporary. Um, the first project, this, this font cracks me up. Um, the first uh, project is uh, the Treetop Trail. This is uh, at the Minnesota Zoo. There's an old monorail system that had shut down over a decade ago, but the structure that this monorail uh, ran on uh, remains today, and we were tasked with turning this into almost a mile and a half. It's a continuous loop that goes through the zoo. It also goes back into what we call, or what the zoo calls a back 40, um, this natural wooded area, really sort of beautiful site. So sort of think of Highline comes to the Minnesota Zoo. It's just nature surrounds us. So it's really the, the um, treetop trail itself is really quiet. We're not obviously planting it since we're surrounded by nature, um, but, it's a really interesting study of kind of taking what was a really sort of overly structured experience um, and allowing it to become one that's about freedom of choice and movement, um, how you get around, you know, and also connecting vertically um, back to the zoo and beyond. This is an image in, in that back 40 area. And then, you know, not just about sort of viewing animals, but I think this idea of viewing people as well. This zoo is really interesting. There's a few of these that um, were designed around these monorails, and you can see in the distance how it slopes up. All of these animal um, exhibits are essentially designed to be seen from above. So it, it's kind of bringing back um, or viewing the, the zoo in the way that it was originally intended. Um, we were able to reuse a lot of existing infrastructure throughout the zoo, which was really exciting. The original monorail um, boarding station, which um, we sort of modified on the left, this grain tower, which was a um, play station that now became a vertical circulation spine that connects the treetop trail um, to the rest of the zoo. And then some of these more immersive experiences where you're actually out, in this case with the bison, sort of moving up and down the trail. Um, again, just really creating a, a, a very quiet experience, you know, one in which what surrounds you is what you take in. Whoops, sorry. I'll just keep going forward. Anyway, that was an under construction shot. Um, this on a much sort of larger scale, this is a modernization for Sorry, uh, Social Security Headquarters just outside of Baltimore. This is a classic 1960s building, no insulation, um, east-west orientation. So literally from like the north to the south facade, there was a 20 degree temperature swing when you'd be in different spaces. As you can see on the right, a classic 1960s federal office building, zero daylight um, entering the middle of the building. And so there was kind of two overarching goals that we had with this. One was the envelope performance and really addressing that um, thermal heat gain that was happening uh, within this floor slab, but then also taking advantage of this incredibly slender floor slab that um, you know, typically you wouldn't build um, because of lack of efficiencies, but it allowed for these amazing panoramic views over Woodlawn, which is this incredibly wooded suburb of uh, outside of Baltimore. So we took it down to the structure, um, redid the cores, worked really closely. Um, this was a collaboration with HJ and their engineers and worked really closely in sort of fine tuning that facade, addressing you know, on each facade from northeast, west, to south, um, a different level of opacity, um, as well as a sort of amount of frit that you'll see 
as you sort of move, this is the northern elevation, and then as you sort of move up into the east and west, you can see that opacity shifting and changing, really addressing um, a lot of what previously um, was really underperforming. But then again, it, it really allowed us to open this up and have these panoramic views. Um, also, a lot of connection between floors. This was really just a pancake building. I mean, there was no volume change anywhere within the building. So um, that created opportunity to just bring additional daylight in. Um, another uh, renovation project or adaptive reuse project is uh, these four buildings. These are located just around the corner from our office in what's called the North Loop. It's a warehouse district in Minneapolis. And uh, it's gonna be a boutique hotel. This is a collaboration with Neary and Hugh who's doing the interiors of the hotel. We're doing the exterior. Um, this is just sort of citing it. Uh, this was a foundry that created commutators um, at, back in the day um, when we started sort of digging into this and researching it a bit more, we became really interested in how that could potentially inform not only sort of at the micro scale, how we address um, and leave the sort of imperfections of the building, but also on the sort of larger block. This is a Japanese technique of using gold to kind of you know, maintain the imperfections of broken pots. And so even on the sort of larger block scale, we started looking at what um, the buildings, you know, which were historic, which ones could be removed, what you see, this row woof, the two on the left, we ended up taking those buildings down because they weren't historic. The commutator is on the right. And then if I can, let's see if I can do this. We had to actually move one of the um, buildings off site. This is the first project we had to move a building. Um, this was just happened last weekend where we were able to move it back. We built the parking below. Um, it was just too tight to be able to um, build what we needed to build below grade um, and maintain this historic building. This is in a historic district, so it was a contributing building to um, this area, and now it's back in place. That's a fun video to watch. <laughs> um, and so this is really about just weaving the new and the old together. Again, you can see the row wolf building is the one in the middle, really forced the massing of this project to break down in ways that it wouldn't have otherwise um, and restored or will be restoring, I should say, uh, the shed of the foundry building into the main lobby of the hotel. Um, this is um, one of the, well, this is, will be my first, I should say, um, uh, net zero project. Uh, it is for, uh, Lakewood Cemetery, I just wanna check my, am I, I'm doing okay I think on time, right? Yeah, um, I'll slow down a bit. I think I'm rushing a little. Um, so let me just go back one, sorry. This is challenging. Oops, I'm missing a slide, that's all right. This is out of order, but I'll just start with this one. Um, so, you know, this is just showing really sort of, this makes it seem a lot easier and simpler than it was, but the way that we were able to bring the EUI down on this project sort of incrementally, you know, looking at envelope, looking at air tightness, uh, looking at controlled sensors and mechanical systems. I mean, it's a really extensive sort of back and forth, and this isn't to mention the amount of work that goes into convincing your client that this is really a good idea. Um, and then sort of getting that to that level where our PV panels will essentially be able to um, equalize. But um, we're there right now, it just started construction, so we are really excited about um, that. Uh, Lakewood Cemetery is a 150-year-old cemetery located um, really kind of in the heart of South Minneapolis between uh, two of our more popular lakes. Um, on the right is an image from when it first opened. It used to be, I mean, cemeteries were the first American parks that we had. People used to picnic, they would hang out. Um, over time, that's changed a lot, but they're really looking at kind of trying to move back in this direction. Um, they're a really progressive cemetery in a lot of ways. They're designing a welcome center, which is very odd for a cemetery, but um, they're really changing from just um, end of life 
celebration to uh, full life celebration. And uh, the Welcome Center is really gonna become um, the key to that. Currently, the entry sits on access to Hennepin Avenue, which is one of the main avenues in Minneapolis. And it uh, runs directly into this Beaux-Arts building. This is their current admin slash welcome center. A lot of people mistake it for a mausoleum for I think somewhat obvious reasons. Uh, there's a, a greenhouse that's adjacent to it. So our job is to really kind of reshift and refocus this entire area. We're adding the welcome center to the east and a garden. It's just part of phase one. Phase two will shift and move the greenhouse with an addition uh, and a transformation of what was the admin building, really creating a new front door and a front yard to this campus. Uh, this is a site plan just showing what that phase one looks like. Uh, there's a series of gardens that surround uh, the new Welcome Center. And then the building itself is really simple in terms of kind of the strategy behind it. There's this canopy and colonnade that creates a, a sort of threshold or this liminal space between the building and the landscape, which was really important. It also ties to some of the more historic buildings on campus. And then um, it's a stone building with these simple wood cutout, or, or what we were calling a wood ribbon that winds through the building, um, creates the, the primary entry that you move into, and then ultimately sort of weaves its way through the main public spaces uh, of the building. Um, and then finally sort of reconnect. What I mean by this is I think it's important for our buildings to be able to give back. Um, find ways to sort of carve out spaces for the public. Um, I will read this one because I think this one's awesome. I think they're all awesome, but um, free space can be a space for opportunity, a democratic space, unprogrammed and free for use, not yet conceived. There's an exchange between people and buildings that happens even if not intended or designed. So buildings themselves find ways of sharing and engaging with people over time. Long after the architect has left the scene, architecture has an active as well as passive life. Um, this is a multifamily project. Uh, we've been recently working with a lot of these projects. They're really challenging, um, typically are developer driven, um, but we've found sort of ways to sort of sneak in interesting public spaces um, and challenge the developers to not put everything up on the roofscape, but to bring it down to grade. Um, this is another building that's actually just a sort of kitty corner from our office. Um, so it's that same neighborhood that the hotel is in. The hotel's actually interesting just above it here. Um, longer story in terms of what all that, how that originally was designed as a sort of single project and then different people ended up taking over ownership, but we still were able to design both projects. Um, but in this neighborhood, the alleys are really the sort of pedestrian ways. Everybody's sort of cuts through. They're no longer really um, vehicular intense. So we sort of flipped the entry, brought it onto the alley side, created this courtyard space and portal that brings you in from the street to almost this sort of hidden courtyard garden space uh, that everyone in the neighborhood can now use and have lunch. Um, so it was just a really nice you know, way to find this merging of public and private um, space. And a lot of these housing projects, we sort of push um, to do that. Just two more projects. Um, I'll go through checking time again. Good. <laughs> um, so Graco Park, this is a area along the Mississippi River. Um, this is part of a much larger master plan that the city of Minneapolis has been um, working on essentially reclaiming industrial land um, along the river like most rivers and most cities. So, you know, we initially sort of ignored them from a public access standpoint. Um, but the area here that you can see highlighted uh, is being converted into a new city park. Um, we're working on the park pavilions that will be placed uh, in this area which are really essentially unprogrammed spaces for outdoor uh, entertainment venues, as well as uh, indoor classrooms, uh, workspaces that different organizations can come into and use. 
Uh, this project was also uh, targeted to be a net zero project, so we're working really uh, closely with the parks department in terms of what that means uh, and how we're gonna get to there, um, but also um, really focused around a low carbon footprint on this project as well. And then finally, this is the largest project I think our studio has worked on to date. It's in uh, collaboration with HOK, both out of um, St. Louis and Kansas City. And it is a new MLS stadium. Uh, it's located at the end of the mall, for those of you that are familiar with St. Louis. I think we're all familiar with the arch, but uh, it's at the opposite end of, of the arch. When we started this project, the mall really just sort of dwindles down to nothing. There was a freeway entrance there. That all came away uh, in order to make this project possible. And we were really interested in that idea of how we extend the mall, what that means for the stadium. And we're able to essentially create this pavilion that sort of physically breaks off uh, from the rest of the stadium and occupies that space uh, along the end of the mall, sort of creates the anchor um, that counters uh, the arch, as you can see off in the distance. This space, one of the things we talked about on this project was 360, 365 days of the year. And what we meant by that was to create activity around this ballpark um, beyond just the game days. And the owner was really on board with this and has been kind of an incredible experience for us, um, being able to really think about the larger district. Um, this has really been transformational for this area. Um, this was formerly, uh, oops, sorry. I'm gonna do it again. We're just gonna keep going. Um, so this has really started to um, push a ton of development in this area, creating a, essentially a sort of new gateway um, towards the north and the west of the city, which were generally underserved. Um, again, if you, you're familiar with any of this area within St. Louis, and so this is a, a really transformative project. Um, one where, you know, this idea of that 360, 360, or 360, um, 365 days of the year, all of the, um, a lot of the restaurants and shops actually open up to the street. You can see the sort of significant amount of plaza and landscaping we were able to get um, but we were also able to work with uh, local artists to remember what um, this was a, a really interesting, thriving neighborhood before we ever got to the project, but um, it's long been gone. But there will be a memorial essentially to this neighborhood um, at the end of the mall. So with that, I think, oh, I, I do have one more of these because I just... <laughs> love it so much, but um, free space provides the opportunity to emphasize nature's free gifts of light, sunlight, and moonlight, air, gravity, materials, natural and man-made resources. That one is great. <laughs> um, so thank you, and I'll, you're up, right? So we'll take questions together at the end of this. So let me see if... <laughs> Do you know how to get yours? Can you guys hear me? I'm gonna move these chairs out of the way because there are so many beautiful images. I wanted to see of yours that this, these were blocking, so we can put this back up during the Q and A. Um, so, totally kicking myself for agreeing to go second after that presentation. Um, really incredible work, Matthew, and uh, important values uh, and, and mission that you had at the beginning there. Um, I don't know why I'm talking into this. Um, so. Today I wanted to talk about um, um, our Lake Flato and our, our, our core values, but start with um, how uh, I came to, to Lake Flato and how these core values were innately part of who I was prior to even, even being in architecture. Um, 
I was raised uh, one state over in Iowa. I had uh, along the Mississippi River right there, I had woods in my backyard and cornfields in my front yard. There were structures such as this that were within walking distance. These were round barns of Iowa, intricately uh, placed in the site and detailed. The craft, uh, truly amazing. And then the amount of colonies. Uh, every year we would drive here, my parents would take us here um, and just see the incredible craftsmanship here. Uh, every single major important event in my life uh, high school graduation, my parents would always get me uh, a piece of furniture. When I was 18, I don't think I um, respected it that much, but so happy I still have those. Um, and, and, and all this said, it wasn't until really in grad school that I found uh, uh, really this. I found Bernard Rudolfsky, and this is my architectural Bible, Architecture Without Architects, and it is so if, if, you, if you don't own it, this is a book you have to have. Um, it is all about what you would do uh, if you were an architect by responding to place, by responding to context. These buildings cannot live anywhere else in the world, nor can they be picked up and rotated 90 degrees. They are specific to, to place. These are incredible wind scoops that catch the prevailing winds um, in Pakistan to cool down the spaces. Um, and then it's noticing details like this, Alto. This is probably my favorite detail of all time. Um, and it's because it's not a detail to be seen, it's a detail to be felt. And so what Alto does is he changes the material from a very warm wood to cool brass at times when your body would move, when you turn corners, when you start to ascend a, a chair or descend a stair. So tactile moments. Architecture is not just for seeing. And then lastly, uh, learning restraint. This is one of my mentors, uh, Glenn Merkett, who told me, uh, Matt, the best ar architecture needn't shout, it whispers. And so that's what we try to do at Lake Flato, which brought me to, uh, to this place. This, is, this was about a month ago. Uh, one of the buildings we designed about, about 30 years ago, our annual retreat. We have 150 people now at Lake Flato, um, 125 in our San Antonio office. Um, we've been in, in here, and 25 in, in Austin. Uh, we've been in here for 35 of the, um, of the 40 years, uh, and right now we're uh, actually renovating it, the first major renovation. Uh, we're turning our garage, uh, the house of the automobile, into a courtyard. So you enter through landscape before the building. I can't believe it took us almost 40 years to do that, but it did. Um, and then a sneak peek from, uh, from earlier this week of uh, construction. Um, and we'll be moving in uh, in a few months. Uh, so many of us think, uh, think of Lake Flato. Many of you might think of Lake Flato as purely Texas, but we are... Uh, work nationally. In fact, three of the four projects I'm going to show you today uh, is outside of the state of Texas. Um, here are probably the closest buildings to where we are, uh, aside from Denver. Um, the bottom two uh, uh, being about a two-hour drive uh, in North Sioux City, South Dakota. That's a residence. And then uh, Ian Nicholson Audubon Center, which I'll be uh, explaining in a little bit more detail uh, to follow. Uh, so we've gotten so big, we, we have uh, six different market sectors now, uh, each about you know, 20 to 30 people. Uh, I help uh, lead the eco-conservation uh, market sector, which is basically land-based, ecologically driven projects. So think of environmental education centers, among many others. Um, while we've gained some recognition along the way, uh, what we are, are feel most proud about and align with our firm ethos and mission and values is the AIA Committee on the Environment. Uh, we've won 14 of these awards, um, and it really uh, melds in our mind the um, design and sustainability as one, not separate. So the first project is... Uh, this one on the bottom left I want to talk to about. It's the uh, Marine Education Center at Gulf Coast Research Labor Laboratory. 
This is for the University of Southern Mississippi. It's actually um, a sad story of, of, of why this project exists. Uh, sad being that um, the previous site was destroyed during Hurricane Katrina. Um, it's over there on, in Biloxi, Mississippi. Um, it was only four feet above sea level. It didn't have any wind breaks. It didn't have any trees to buffer uh, the hurricane. Um, and this was the building. And because of that, this was uh, what happened. Uh, surprisingly, the, um, the main damage for this building was not the hurricane, it was not the storm surge. It was actually uh, the debris pulling back into the ocean um, and blowing through the building. Uh, so the new site, we were lucky enough to, to actually have it uh, uh, right here on these fingers uh, overlooking Davis Bayou, which were actually 19 feet above sea level, uh, which is a, a huge anomaly along the Gulf Coast. Um, and so in choosing the site, we knew we had to be very, very delicate. This was a sensitive landscape. And so what we do first is we listen to the people who know the landscapes best. Those are coastal ecologists, those are geologists, those are biologists, those are landscape architects. They lead uh, and we follow. Um, so in analyzing the site, um, really we could have built anywhere above 16 feet. Uh, we could have fit the entire building over on the east side here. Uh, but as you all know, uh, flood levels don't decrease, they always increase. And so we shoot for the 500 year. Uh, so that at the time was 18 feet. That's the 100 year now. So we created a building zone that we were wanted to build out of, which then meant that the program had to push to the western side. This is uh, one of my heroes on the project. This is Larry Lewis, a uh, coastal ecologist. Um, we walked the site for almost a half day with him and studied and analyzed different soils. He taught us about which were sensitive ecotones, which we could build on, which we could to stay away from. And this was a forested bayhead, uh, one of the most sensitive areas of the site, which is right in the middle. It's sensitive because it filters all the water down into the tidal marsh and cleans it prior to going into the Gulf of Mexico. But what we did here uh, is with Larry is we walked the buildable uh, site, the buildable zone, and we flagged the trees that were either invasive, uh, non-native, or at the end of their life cycle. These were trees that would come down first in a hurricane. We then removed those non-natives and it cleared a path for us in where, where to place our buildings. Many people, what they do in the Gulf Coast and along uh, uh, hurricane zones is they're so afraid of the trees falling on their building that they create, they just clear cut 300 feet and they place their building right in the middle. By doing that, you just got rid of your wind buffer. Uh, so what we did is we snaked our building within this so that we could have the oldest and the strongest trees push right up against the building and protect it. Again, none of this would ever be possible without listening to the land, without listening to Larry Lewis, coastal ecologist. So here's a cross section. Uh, on the east side, you have uh, exhibit, admin, administrative offices, uh, multi-purpose spaces, observation platform that then picks you up to go into the Gulf. It is a marine education uh, center. That is the main side of the campus. On the west side are labs and classrooms. So during their high season, which is the summer, um, they actually um, go to both sides, but then they're able to close down a big portion of it, their site and concentrate everybody on the east side to still have a lively campus. Um, we purposely split the buildings up too so that the um, the whole circulation was a learning experience. So you walked through the five different ecotones uh, on the way from building to building, and they were learning points to take for the marine environment. Of course, when looking at form, this was all before, really, before looking at any forms. Uh, uh, the forms that respond best to the climate and context, in my opinion, are vernacular buildings before they had mechanical units. And so we realized from all these uh, 
uh, projects, very steep roofs. It rains 65 inches a year. You, it's very important to shed rain quickly. Here's what some initial uh, drawings in schematic design. We do draw a lot by hand still uh, before going into uh, Revit. So this was somewhere in design development and then this was the final. We knew we wanted to make big gestures for entry sequences, both from the arrival of the visitor, but also the arrival from staff. Uh, this is a pine forest, so we wanted that the verticality of, of the forest to be represented in the entry sequence. And then of course, um, one thing I, I negated to mention, day one of this project, the director said, I want this building, this building will end up in the ocean one day. It, it, so I want the materials you use to be good for the, not harm the environment. So these are all uh, typical uh, southern yellow pine that you can find at any lumber yard, two by, two by 12 was the largest we did so that if any part of this building came down in a hurricane, it could be easily rebuilt. Some other, uh, sustainability um, items with this is um, lifting it off the ground, allowing the water to flow to where it wanted to be in the first place. We actually had members of the university come and take soil tests uh, before and after to make ensure that we were uh, dealing with placing the water where it needed to be. And then the craft part of it, detailing. Like I said, this is still drawing by hand. This was, this was I sat down here and just tried to figure out the, the, the foundation and kind of just, just went with it. And this is just, there's something about touching uh, the paper that just makes you want to build it well. Some of the interiors, lab space. Of course, understanding that all the learning doesn't happen within the building, but the courtyards as well. And then of course arrival, not only by land, but by sea. This was all done using FEMA funded money. So as you can imagine, it was very tricky to come in budget. Uh, but one of the defining features is how bridging across this very sensitive forested bayhead, a uh, 200 foot long cable suspension bridge this is the director flying the drone, um, looking back at him. Uh, so to do this, we, uh, we, we, we found some bridge builders in Seattle, Washington, actually. These guys uh, helicoptered into sites and would build bridges without any heavy machinery. And we knew they had to be perfect for this job. We did not want a bulldozer, anything in that forest of Bayhead. So they flew amongst the trees and erected uh, this bridge. And this is the entry sequence from the staff. And then the west side, classrooms and labs. The second project I want to talk about is uh, the only one I'll be showing you in, in Texas. It's uh, right down from where I live on the San Antonio River. This was an interesting one because if you can believe it, I was the owner on this project as well. And by owner, I mean I, I served on the board of the San Antonio River Foundation, who was our client. And so um, I did not, well, I was not on the design team very purposely. And, uh, but it was funny because when I would uh, hang out with, in the office and, and see people working on this project, and then we'd both walk out the door together to go to the board meeting, and I would sit on one side of the table, and they would sit on the other. And many times I had to recuse myself be, uh, because of that, but uh, very interesting being on, on both sides. Um, so the, the brief for this was, it's at the confluence, uh, the, the confluence of the um, San Antonio River and San Pedro Creek, so the convergence of these two waterways. Um, number one, we had the, the brief was to partner with an artist to make this pavilion that spoke to water conservation. So we partnered with Andrew Cudless from Matsey's. Um, he was a, a trained architect that went to school with one of the partners on this project, um, and it was in collaboration with him. Really the main, main vision uh, of the pavilion uh, came from Andrew. 
So the idea was not to shun water. Typically buildings, umbrellas, shun water, they send it to the outside. We wanted to send it to the inside, to collect it, to funnel it. Much the same way uh, the leaves of a plant, by taking the water down into the stem itself. Where this could be a place that would be as magical, even more during the rain, uh, than on a sunny day. So the inspiration uh, were these flowers, the petals, the petals that would collect the water. They're collecting water and underground, underneath there is a 100,000 uh, gallon cistern. So how do you build something like this? Um, Andrew Cudless knew uh, some boat builders. He was living in Oakland at the time. Uh, and so um, these boat builders would, would create fiberglass molds out of uh, styrofoam. And from these molds, they would then ship the molds on site to San Antonio, Texas, uh, where we would pour the concrete, three different size petals, and then lift the petals into place. And we had an incredible structural engineer, Chuck Nave, on this project uh, that made, really made this all happen. That uh, cistern is not to scale. <laughs> But the reason for the, uh, collecting all the rainwater is then to highlight the various ecotones of Texas within the park itself, the landscape. And then lastly, uh, one of the more important spaces, the education center uh, here for teaching uh, those of us that are most important and being the children how they learn about tributaries and waterways. And then um, it being so special, I had to throw this next slide in. Um, we have a Halloween co uh, contest every, every year, and uh, one of the interns uh, uh, drew inspiration from this and became uh, King Confluence. Uh, this was on Monday. So his, his crown is made of the petals uh, of, of Confluence, but I, I just want you to point out the staff too. It looks like a cobra, but it's actually one of the petals. And so this was uh, um, Curtis, an intern who dressed up like this. Uh, the next project is uh, here in the Midwest, uh, outside of Chicago, Illinois, um, for the Lake County Forest Preserve District. And um, we, uh, the brief for this was they wanted a net zero building um, either um, to be uh, FIAS uh, certified or living building. Um, so we got the job, interviewed and got the job and um, re quickly realized the limitations of the site. Um, these are in the flatwoods uh, of Northern Illinois, um, very, very sensitive, um, kind of boggy uh, forest, if you can imagine. Um, and very restrictive uh, build zones. But I, I just find the more restrictive the build zone, the more it just tells you what it wants to be. With heritage oaks on either side, really had to, had to shoehorn this building in. Um, two classrooms for education, uh, an exhibit uh, uh, room as you enter, uh, flanked by restrooms with uh, an entry sequence through a screened outdoor classroom. So, very simple program. Um, so the reason we went FIAS uh, was that we realized that just being going down this avenue got us 90% of the way there to net zero. Um, and how? How, how? how was this done? Look at the R values, 101 for the roof. That's a two foot thick roof. <laughs> I don't think I've, I've done a, a, a R value more than 50. Uh, before on a roof, um, but this is how you get there. We were lucky enough to have somebody at Lake Flato that worked nothing but passive houses. He worked at Lake Flato, he went to Maine, worked doing nothing but passive houses, and then returned to Lake Flato with some incredible knowledge. It's also a first using uh, Ornilux uh, bird protection glass out of Germany, uh, infused into triple glazing for a FIA certified project, the first in North America 
perhaps the world, but we don't know for sure. So some images. This was us doing a full-scale mock-up on site. Um, heritage trees flanked on both sides. We were really worried about the height, sneaking underneath that, making sure we didn't get underneath the drip line so much. We did the best we could to, to, to imagine uh, um, the length of the canopy, but wanted to go there. And, and um, Also, the, the, this gentleman here taking the photo, he's the owner. Who, they were also the landscape architect, so it's funny because what we do before we even start designing anything is we throw ideas off of landscape architects, but they're the owner too, so we're kind of opening up the curtain a little bit, and uh, they would question some stuff before we even had it figured out, but um, it was a fun process. And this is uh, last week on site. So uh, I couldn't, lastly, I, I couldn't get out of here without, without presenting this, uh, this project just down, uh, just to the west here in Gibbon, Nebraska. I, ev I even uh, wore my uh, Sandhill Crane socks uh, for the occasion here. They're custom uh, Rowe Sanctuary Auto Ian Nicholson Audubon Center socks. Um, but for, uh, many of you probably know, but um, this phenomena that you have a couple hours away is one of the most incredible wildlife experiences I've ever witnessed. Uh, each year, four to 500,000 sandhill cranes uh, on their way north on the central flyway stop on the, along the Platte River and roost for about six weeks, um, gaining strength uh, before heading up north. And the ritual, what happens is um, they come and they, the, the Platte River is, uh, is you know, so it was said to be a mile wide and an inch deep. And so the cranes roost there at night. They feel protected. Um, and so they'll fly in and they'll slowly, at dusk, start to build and build and build. This was a photo uh, I took uh, from the blinds uh, themselves. Um, and w w by the time it's dark, the entire river is full of these cranes. And for those of you who haven't, haven't heard Sandhill Crane uh, squawk before, it is deafening. Sick. And so um, here was the site. There's an existing visitor center. But the brief was to uh, come up with a bird blind specific to viewing sandhill cranes, which is very different than viewing other types of birds. And I'll tell you why. Uh, when we got there, these were the current uh, blinds. Um, you can see there were very small windows. Um, and the act of viewing cranes is a panoramic one. It's not spot viewing. Spot viewing is what you would do if you have a blind with binoculars and see a bird and look at a bird. This, this kind of aperture is fine for that, but not for the panoramic experience. So this is what we wanted. This is a precedent we found uh, of a bird hide, bird blind in Scotland, uh, opens up to that view. So what we did is we did ergonomic studies. Uh, it's the old trick of kind of you know, facing forward. And when do you see your, your finger here? When do you see your finger here? So your field of view. We wanted to design a structure to where you were standing there and did not see a frame at all. So you felt like you were standing with and amongst the cranes. So then we studied the average heights of every human being on the planet. Uh, and figured an opening size that went from those that were five feet tall up to those that were six foot four, 97.5% of everybody on the planet, and also had ramps uh, and wheelchair accessible spaces as well. We also noticed that when you're there, what they do is when the, the cranes fly in and they roost uh, at night, and you have to get there an hour before, um, before it gets dark, and then you're there an hour after uh, they're, they're done. So you're, you're there three hours. And this is in March in Nebraska, as you all know, very cold. So everyone has gear. And everyone's gear, when we were there, was placed behind them in the dark. So people are tripping all over the place. So we wanted to 
pull you away from the end. They also were having problems because people were taking their binocular or their cameras and sticking it through the blind itself. And once the cranes saw anything protrude out from the blinds, the whole flock would fly away. And for those who waited the whole year to see them, uh, it would not get that experience. So we separated it from the edge there, creating a nook. And also, this is, this is an old uh, diagram, but, but right here, this person sitting in the back, what we noticed is that there were chairs set up. And so if you were getting tired, because you would, after three hours, you would stare at the back side of somebody. Um, so what we did is we elevated that so that when you were sitting, you could actually have an elevated view to see out. And also, uh, what we realized is that people were cramming to get into the best spots. And so people were more than shoulder to shoulder. So doing studies on uh, the maximum comfort level of people standing next to each other. And then uh, lastly, uh, a warming module and back for those um, that got a little too cold. Now, part of the brief too was that the cranes are only there for six weeks out of the year. So there are 46 weeks that the cranes aren't there. So how do you design uh, a building, we call it the discovery station, to where it can act as a classroom too? Because in the, summers, uh, classes, in the summer, classes come and they clean the river. So we wanted to have a, a flexible space that opened up on the backside as well for learning experiences. And this was for the opening of the first blind. And then we had four of them, and they were all located in different bends of the river. Some of them were perpendicular to the river. Some of them were parallel to the river, as you will see here. But what I found uh, the most exciting was the entry sequence to these, because you had to sneak in there while the crane, if, if it was in the morning, the cranes were still there. You had to sneak in. So this one, which is out in the middle of the prairie, very, very exposed, they use uh, hay, hay bales. They, they cut the prairie, cut the hay, and then place them as the blind uh, for the, when the cranes are there. Then other entry experiences uh, for those that are tucked in. This is a wall that's really incredible, designed by a landscape architect that actually folds up uh, for six weeks, but then folds down. So you have that view of the river when the cranes aren't there. Just some shots of it on the backside. And then that panoramic view. Um, we were also tasked with uh, designing a system that was quiet to open and close, because sometimes it would start to snow, start to rain. Uh, so you'd have to shut these off uh, live uh, in the space. You can see that elevated uh, seat on the back there. Thank you. So we have time for a few questions from the audience. If we can get both Matthew and Matt back on the stage. While they're thinking of their first question, I'll start with one. Um, which is, I have a fascination with the process of design and how you go about that. We saw some examples of process shots from on-site mock-ups to hand drawings from Matt. And Matthew showed some pin-up sessions that looked like internal to the, the team. I wonder if you could both speak to how you approach process, what kind of tools you use. We find physical massing models or study models, or is it mostly digital? Um, how does process approach, and is it standardized or formula, um, formalized within the studio, or is it more individual to the team members? Well, I know I'm going to send all my studio members to their studio to learn how to draw, because <laughs> that's awesome. Um, no, but, you know, it's, I mean, it varies from project to project, for sure. I will say one thing that I kind of find frustrating, and um, I think maybe the older I get, the more frustrated I get with sort of just jumping right into the computer before you've put pen to paper, right? And just started to think of what are the ideas? What are the concepts? 
I think you can get there so much quicker, whether it's a little quick sketch model or a drawing. Um, but there has been a tendency that I've just noticed, especially with younger um, studio members that come in that just want to instantly get into the 3D model. So we, you know, we push and try to like, you know, resist that a little bit and force people to, to sketch. Um, I don't know the last time I've seen anyone sketch though a, a wall section. <laughs> <laughs> we, we do, I shouldn't say that, we, there's one person that does it and they're amazing. They actually can draw everything to scale, like without, you know, having a scale in their hand. But um, yeah, it, I mean, it varies from project to project for us. Um, I, I would say for us, it's, um, it doesn't start, the process starts with, especially in our studio with landscape architects and, and, and biologists and ecologists um, doing diagrams. And we don't do any thinking or drawing. And you get a slap on the wrist if you start, they start drawing before, before they develop some of the understanding of the, of the ecology. And then talking through them, understanding the trees, understanding you know, that, that, that pine trees have, have tap roots and that they need to live together uh, in order to be strong. Uh, and, that groups them together. It, it, you start to understand what your footprint of the building wants to be by the footprint of the landscape. And so um, we always, always start uh, that way. Great, thank you. Questions from the audience? Um, just in general, have you ever like done a project that's like your best project or your favorite project to this date since you've like started your fields? <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll give an answer that Julie always gives is her best project is always the next one. Um, and you know, I, I don't really, I don't have a best or favorite project really. I think there's elements of every project that I've worked on um, through the years that, you know, I appreciate for different, you know, qualities of what we, you know, discovered or um, explored. But, uh, no, I mean, I don't. I, um, I, I don't. I, I don't know. I don't know how to. That's a really hard question, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, Plus, uh, hopefully there's no clients in the audience, right? <laughs> no, yeah, I, I, uh, I don't know. You just appreciate them differently. You appreciate the really hard ones. You appreciate the real uh, simple ones <laughs> uh, that aren't simplistic. Um, and then um, I, I don't know. I, they're, they're, they're always uh, ones that somebody else does. <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, I mean, it, it, that is a really hard question. And I think, you know, one of the things, if I just look at kind of my sort of trajectory, you know, when I first started uh, working at, at the time, it was Julie Snow Architects. Um, you know, I had no intention to become a design principal or owner of a firm. So, you know, I used to get in there and I was drawing and, you know, I was doing all the work, right? And so over time, you know, I've become less of that person that's actually, you know, sketching things out to more of an editor. And so you're, you know, you're, it's not only like the projects, but it's sort of what you're doing on the projects will vary and that'll happen for all of you as well. I mean, it, you're going to be playing different roles. You're going to be maybe more of a project manager or architect. I mean, what you realize when you come out of school is how completely different <laughs> the practice is from studio, right? Like studio's kind of getting you a little taste of, um, it's, it's helping you think, right? It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a great uh, education, but there is just so much more that happens uh, in design studios. And, you know, to hear the collaboration, I think we're, we're really similar with, with our landscape architects. It's kind of from the beginning of each of these projects, they're just landscape and architecture go hand in hand. It's, it's really hard for us to separate them. I know there are some studios that kind of bring the landscapes uh, architects in towards the end, but it's such a lost opportunity when you do that. Um, so. I was gonna say, on average, like how much time does it take to, like, to research, then see your project like built out, 
and then like see it as a final product from like your, from it on like a blueprint to like what it is in real life. <laughs> you want me to start? Um, it can range so dramatically. Um, and I'll just give an a example. We have a project that we're working on um, in St. Thomas, U.S. Virgin Islands. It's a federal building. It's year seven or eight. Uh, it's been through two hurricanes. Uh, it's, it's been a really long process. We have another um, GSA project in upstate New York. It's a land port of entry crossing. Also uh, almost a 10 year long project. So we have projects that, you know, and there, there's some starting and stopping that happened, but we have a lot of projects that are almost a decade long. Um, we don't have a lot of small scale, like uh, quick ones, although like most recently, I guess the smallest was a um, cabin we did in Northern Minnesota. So that's, you know, you can get that done in a few weeks, you know, from a concept design almost to a documentation, it can go really fast. Um, but you're always looking at like a year of construction. Um, for me, especially the eco conservation studio, lots of times you're working with nonprofits and um, nonprofits have an average lifespan for executive directors of three years. So if you don't hit that three years, project goes away. Usually the next director doesn't want to do what the, la the previous director's vision was, number one. Number two, you got to fit that in between recessions. Uh, number three, then you got to fundraise for them because these nonprofits don't have the money up front. And so I would say that probably 95%, 90-95% of all the projects in our studio never get built. Um, so I've, I've, I mean, I, I've probably worked on 100, 100, I don't even know, 150 projects and probably have 10 or 15 built. So, uh, so lots of times they never, that, that's probably the most surprising thing coming out of school that pe people are like, what? <laughs> <laughs> like, I just worked for two years on this project, it's not gonna get built? Like, yeah, well, well, that's just kind of what you sign up for with the, the, that type of project. Perhaps time for one more question. So when you're designing, obviously there's a lot of like reiterating, coming up with new ideas and stuff, but how do you decide when you're done like designing and it's time to be actually like built? Uh, when your partners come over to you and say that you're out of fee. <laughs> uh, no, but um, uh, usually it's, it's just, you just kind of know and, and you collaborate and you go through iterations and we're very collaborative. We, a lot of those, those ideas on the Marine Education Center came from, we had an intern who was still in school at the time and suggested some major moves that we, we, we used, and which is super, super fun. So uh, the more minds you have in the room, the faster you can get there. Yeah, no, I, it's fee. I mean, that it's, it, once you get into practice, I mean, you are dealing with sort of real world issues, but I mean, we run into the same problems you sort of do in studio, right? Where you just wanna kind of continue to push and change, I think. One of the things Julie and I try to really establish in the studio though is very early on is to sort of set what are the conceptual sort of, what's the conceptual logic of the project, the framework that the whole team can kind of get around so you, you're not rethinking in DD and CD and you know, I know there are firms that will kind of just continue to sort of do that and um, you're not able to, in my opinion, develop the details. I mean, it's, that's why we have the you know, schematic design, design development, construction documents. You're supposed to be focused on different areas in those. So if you can really move through that process as clearly as possible and um, just have clarity of focus, um, you know, restraint is a word we use all the time as well in our, in our studio. I think trying to sort of pull back and realize you don't have to try to do everything on every project, right? Like what are those elements that are very specific to that project, to that place, to that client, um, and just stay focused. 
I know I said that was the last question, but I have one more, um, which is about the nuances of sight and the influence of sight on the work, which I think was a theme in both presentations. Matthew and yours, it seemed more the kind of socio-political context of urban sites in Minneapolis and in St. Louis, and then Matt, in your case, kind of ecological readings of sight. And yet, when I look at the bodies of work by both practices, I think there's a coherency that would tell us that not everything is being determined by this particular site or that particular site. And so I wonder if you could unpack some of the subtle ways in which there, that coherency emerges, whether it's from certain formal ideas or themes or material systems that carry through from project to project. So in a way, how do you deal with responding to these very specific contexts, but also produce a body of work that has a voice across many projects in many different contexts? That's it's a really interesting question. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's something Julie and I talk about a lot. We've actually been talking with the studio specifically about that because we've heard people in the studio say, oh, this doesn't look like a Snow cry -like project. And we're like, wait a minute. That's, <laughs> that's not what we should be talking about. We, you know, we're trying to actually get people to push beyond so that there isn't, you know, I mean, what I would hope is it's not necessarily a sort of style that is carried through, but it's an attitude an approach to the work, um, a sort of rigor in the detail, the assembly, the performance, um, and for sure, you know, the contextual influences that, you know, for us are, you know, it's landscape, it's cultural, it's political. I think we get really excited about all of that um, and how that can influence our projects to make them uh, very much about that place. But, uh, you know, I think, in general, there is there's a there is a level of restraint in the work that we do that I think does sort of have it's it's quiet. You know, we, we like to say like we try to quiet our voice so that um, the voice of our clients can kind of rise through. But I think in doing that, we also have a very restrained palette, um, oftentimes on projects that you know does create a consistency, but is also specific to place. Um, I think with us, it's. Um We've really, especially in the last few years, have uh, developed a material red list. Um, that project you saw, Confluence Park, would never happen today. Uh, we don't. Uh, we're really trying to limit our use of concrete. Period. Like no concrete, um, which is really hard. <laughs> um, and so, by by developing this uh, zinc, for instance, too, for the Marine Education Center, you just start to learn that um, you know the chemicals leach into the. Uh, um, into the waterways and um, and the chemicals and um, if you can't use concrete you can't you can't cantilever x amount so it starts to tell you the form that you need to use um, matched with the context you're in and uh, I'd say that's probably the closest answer I can give you. Great, thank you. And thank you for the wonderful presentations and enriching discussion. <laughs>